Well, let's take a closer look now at innovation in China with Saurabh Gupta. He's a senior Asia-Pacific international relations policy specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Thank you for being here. So, Sarah, talk about this journey that China has been making from mass manufacturing to now high-end manufacturing and innovation. It's, China is at a very important point, an inflection point, a pregnant moment. Reform and opening up in 1978 was about doing investment-led growth. And now it's come to that moment where China needs to do it through technological and high technology and advanced manufacturing-led growth and also become a more consumer-oriented uh, society. Uh, there's plenty of innovation in China, though we also need to know that a, a lot of that innovation is based on American core technologies, found foundational technologies like chips, and that's why it's very important to get U.S.-China relations right so that, that, so that that commerce and high technology products can continue. And that's important to highlight that collaboration. We know that some experts think that the U.S.-China trade tensions have really led to a crackdown in more Chinese students returning home. How important is that versus, say, other factors when it comes to the talent pool returning back to China? I think it's very important both for the U.S. and for China to have an open regime in terms of interaction, people-to-people -people interaction, scholars interaction, and technologists interaction. Both sides get richer, both sides get more prosperous, and the world becomes more beneficial. And I think it's, it's, it, it is a dark cloud that is lingering over U.S.-China ties in terms of these denials, perhaps, of student visas and limiting them doing research at American universities. There is obviously a benefit for China because a lot of these very educated Chinese who are already in American universities will come home in a very, very fertile technology ecosystem and be able to do good work. But I think at the end of the day, both sides are better off with that interchange and exchange. So in terms of the talent pool in China, does it currently meet the needs, uh, when, especially when you look at the pace of innovation in China? It's hard to say. Perhaps not, but I know China is also putting out a lot of graduates, graduate students in the area of engineering. Perhaps where China is deficient even in that area is the quality of the students that it is putting out in terms of engineering. They're good students, but we sometimes get too focused on just the big cities and we don't think about in, in, small, in other provinces, outlying provinces, the level of education and transfer of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's important that the students that there is technological exchange between these two countries, not just within China, because I think we'll have a much richer pool and it will help the U.S. I mean, so much of innovation in the U.S. is done also by students who come with international backgrounds and then set up companies in Silicon Valley. Right. So I think it's win-win on both sides. Now, a big issue a lot of countries are facing when it comes to high tech is the, is the skills gap. So talk about the role of Chinese universities in really trying to, to put out students that can meet the needs of tomorrow's employers. Oh, absolutely. I mean, China has placed a great degree of emphasis, and this is, to some extent, it is top-down emphasis because they understand how valuable and important it is, and particularly to make that transition from an investment led to a high technology advanced manufacturing society is not easy. We are seeing also a, a, foreign in, a draft foreign investment law which is going to make this sort of technology sharing, I mean, literally go through the roof, and that's a great, 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 uh, great for both sides. But that obviously requires that also at the Chinese side that they are able to cope with that demand, that latent demand that is there within industry for really high-skilled students to be able to take, the, take their innovation to the next level. Now, along with innovation, obviously, comes the issues of protection, not just between companies when it comes to intellectual property, but also protecting consumers. How, do we, how much do we know about how China is keeping pace in terms of its overall protections for both companies and for consumers? That's, that's a really interesting question, simply because, you know, within this last couple of months, we've had some scare stories in terms of gene editing and et cetera, et cetera, areas of innovation where... Uh, where, the, where the policy regime, the regulatory regime, is not as detailed. First of all, one doesn't have a very detailed regulatory regime because you have what, what is called a regulatory sandbox. 
It's like children playing and doing innovation within a, within a sandpit like that. You want to have regular, you don't want to, to be over-regulated so that there is more innovation. Right. But as innovation is making leaps and strides forward, it's also important that uh, regulators be able to manage that process so we don't have horror stories coming out. And that's why I think the government restructuring that China did over this past year is very, very important in terms of being able to build that regulatory capacity to police this sort of, and, and facilitate, frankly, this sort of innovation. All right, always good to have you. Sarab Gupta there, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies.